Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all, and it's good to be back with you again. Thank you for your prayers while I was away, and a big thank you to those who covered, uh, to David, to James, to anybody else who took part in services, to looked after emergencies. I'm really grateful for your help and your cover while I was away. Now, back to announcements. Tonight, we have our prayer time at 5.30, and then encounter this evening at 6.30, and we look forward to hearing from Thomas <clears throat> tonight in our encounter service. Choir practice is at 6.45 on Thursday. Now, harvests are coming really fast. Isn't it awful that you're just back from summer holidays, and summer is just happening, and we're thinking about harvest already. Harvest isn't very far away. And so if you'd like to join the choir, you will be more than welcome, but please come Thursday evening at a quarter to seven. Prayer time after choir at 8 p.m. Now, next Saturday, notice change of date. It was to be Sunday, but there's just too much going on on Sunday. So Ellie, come and tell us what's happening on Saturday. <clears throat> On Saturday, um, we're going to be having our prayer day. Um, it's going to be very relaxed. So there'll be different stations for different organizations, BB, GB, Sunday School. Um, each of those organizations are giving us the points so we can pray exactly what they need prayer for. Um, we just really want to cover all the ministries of the church in prayer as we move into the next season of ministry in um, September forward. Um, yeah, it's so important um, to cover them in prayer because alone we can do nothing. Um, it's all through God and for God. Um, so there's sign-up sheets on each porch um, this morning. So if you're on your way out of church, um, we'd love if you could just sign up for one hour. Um, come for an hour, pray for an hour. It's for all ages. There's no younger limit, older limit. Um, and if you can't sign up for an hour, if you can't commit to an hour, that's fine. Just come and go as you please. Um, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long you can give. Thank you, Ellie. It is so important that we begin the year, so uh, uh, September's always the beginning of a new year for me, I don't know if you see it like that, but it's the beginning of a new church year, a new academic year, a new school year, and we really want to cover everything in prayer. The young people have taken this initiative, and I really do ask you to support them in it, and I'd love to see so many names signed up for a slot in the prayer room next Saturday from 9 in the morning to 9 in the evening. You can sign for two if you want. You can stay all day if you want. Uh, it's not that we're all going to be praying together necessarily. That may happen at times, but you can move around and just spend time praying in stillness, in quietness, in God's presence. Um, but really, please, I would love that you would support that and that we would go into this new season bathed in prayer. Next Sunday, then, is our Back to Church Sunday. I hope you've all had one of these wee leaflets <clears throat> and, the <clears throat> and the other leaflet that goes with it. I haven't been used to shouting for three weeks, and now I'm back. I'm going to learn my voice is getting adjusted again. These wee leaflets, please give them out and invite people back to church. People who maybe belong to the church but haven't come in a long time. Would you invite them? Because I can say it from the front till I'm blue in the face. But if you give them a personal invitation and say, come with me, there is more chance that you'll get them to come than that I'll get them to come. So please issue these invitations. Ask people to come back. Maybe it's people who've never been to church and don't belong anywhere else. Then please invite them to come and assure them that they'll be welcome here as well. So that's back to church Sunday. It's followed, so it's an all-age service, family service, and it will be followed by hot dogs and burgers and ice cream in the hall afterwards. So don't miss out next Sunday morning. Now, I know that while I've been away, there's been a distribution of leaflets going on. Thank you for that. Uh, there are still some areas to be hit and some leaflets left. So if you could take a pack, they're in the porch and they've got, a, they've got areas on to be delivered in. If you could take a pack of leaflets, it's basically just letting people know we're here, what we do, and inviting them to come and join in in anything that they want to. So please, would you take a pack 
and distribute them. Don't take them if you're not going to distribute them. We want to know that they have gone out, so please do that. Um, and then lastly, Alpha is beginning very soon on Monday evenings out in Common Ground. Again, a wonderful opportunity for people who've maybe just become a Christian but aren't quite sure about the basics of faith and want to ask questions, then you're welcome to come along. But also if you have friends or neighbors who are exploring faith or who have questions about faith, then they're also welcome. Why don't you come and bring them? That's starting out in Common Ground on the 20, 23rd. Thank you, the 23rd of September. And very, very lastly, could vestry members who are in church this morning remain behind just for a wee minute? Is there anything else that I've forgotten? Shout at me now if there is. All good. Then let's still our hearts for worship. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here that we come into your presence. And as we do, Lord, we ask that you would create a pure heart within us and renew a right spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill us that we might worship Jesus. we might honor and glorify God. Let's stand to worship him together.
we pray that you would give us amazing grace that we might praise your name for all our days and we sit or kneel to pray as we join together in the words of the collect for purity knowing that we need his amazing grace his grace that gives us what we don't deserve forgiveness for our sins. And so we pray, Almighty God, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. <clears throat> you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write these, your laws, in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, 
and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments, to live in love and peace. Almighty God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The collect for this, the 15th Sunday after Trinity. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love. Grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may abound and be found in steadfast faith and active in service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're starting a new series today, uh, and it won't be as long as the last one, but it's a shorter, short, much shorter book. But for the next few weeks, maybe not next Sunday because it's back to church Sunday, but we're going to be looking at the book of Ruth. I've been looking at it over the summertime, and while I've always loved the story, I've never seen just quite as much in it as I've seen over these past few weeks. So our reading is from Ruth chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Great story, boys and girls, you listen to. So if you don't know where the book of Ruth is, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, just before Samuel. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went, they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab, <clears throat> that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> We're going to stand and, and worship again, but boys and girls, if you want to already make your way out to the annex, if you're going to children's church or crash, those who are going with them, please already make your way out there. Uh, and we hope that you will have a great time out there as you learn more about God. <clears throat> <clears throat> stand.
sing that again. Lord, we pray that you would help us now to be still, to be still as we turn to your word, to be still in our hearts and in our minds, so that we can hear what you would say to each one of us through your living word, in the power of your spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> now, when I say what I'm about to say, I know the men are in danger of turning off. Please don't. Who loves a good love story? Who loves a good romantic comedy movie? Okay, so I'm seeing the men aren't with me on this. I love to watch a period drama from time to time. And over the summer, one of the things that I watched was Sanditon. Has anybody watched it? It's one of Jane Austen's things, and it was on ITV. But anyway, I watched the whole first series, about eight episodes. And there's these two people, and spoiler alert, I'm not going to tell you the names, but you're hoping the whole way through these eight episodes that these two people are going to get together. And they do. But then there's series two and three. And so you're like, you've just invested so much in these characters. You've invested so much in the hope that they're going to get together. And they do, and they're going to be happy. And you watch episode one of series two, and he's died. And you go, what? This is not how it was meant to be. This is not how it was meant to turn out. And I'm like, I don't pot with this. I'm not going to watch another two series of this if it's going to end with something stupid like this. Because I want happy endings. So you know what I did? I googled it <laughs> to see how it would end before I invested time in watching the next two series. I know that's just like, what? But I like to be able to watch it knowing that there's going to be a good ending and that I'm not going to be miffed when I get to the end. So this is a terrible start to a story. But can I assure you, if you've never read the book of Ruth, there's a really, really good ending. So stay with it. You see, it's not just a love story. It is one of the most beautiful love stories ever written, I think. 
Uh, and it's one of the only two books in the Bible that are named after a woman. And she's not even a Jewish woman. She's a Moabitess. But what we see above and beyond the love story in this book are two major themes about God that run through it, through two threads that run through this story. And the one is the providence of God. We don't talk so much about the providence of God in that term anymore. What is the providence of God? The providence of God is knowing that God is sovereign, that God is over all things, and that even when really bad things happen, in his providence, in his goodness, in his love, he can bring something really good out of it. Providence is where God takes something that in the natural is really bad and in the spiritual works something mighty, something good through it. So watch, we watch that happen. How even when people make bad choices, still God is, is sovereign and loving and caring and kind over it all. The second theme is, of course, that theme of redemption. And in this book, in every love story nearly, in every film you watch nearly, there's a, there's a theme of redemption. Uh, and in this book, we're going to see that there's a, a kind of like a wee picture of a redeemer that points forward, obviously, to the ultimate redeemer, who is Jesus. You've heard the wee saying, haven't you, that the new is in the old contained and the old is in the new explained. Or the new is in the old concealed, but the old is in the new revealed. You've heard that. And we're going to see that in the book of Ruth as well. So watch out for those wee themes as we go through it. Let's turn to the verse 1. Ruth 1 verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled. Now we need to stop right there, don't we? Because this sets this story in history. It sets it in a time period, a history period of Israel's past, in the period of the judges. Now, we studied Judges in Bible study not that very long ago, but what do you remember about the book of Judges? It's an awful period in the history of the people of Israel. You see, Moses has led them out of Egypt into the promised land, along with Joshua after Moses into the promised land. But Moses and Joshua are dead. They're in the promised land. They're taking possession of the land, but they haven't driven out all their enemies. And now they have no real leader. And when they have no real leader, what tends to happen is that people wander away from God. They turn to their own ways and they turn to the ways of the people around them. They haven't driven out the Canaanites. And the Canaanites worship Baal. And they think that fertility uh, and good harvest and all of that comes from worshiping Baal. And so the people of God, the people of Israel, forget the very first commandment, you shall have no other gods but me. And they join in worshiping Baal with the Canaanites around them. And they begin to compromise and they lose God's ways in favor of their own ways and the ways of the people around them. And we get this very sad indictment right at the end of the book of Judges, the verse before Ruth. It says, in those days, Israel had no king and everybody did as they saw fit in their own eyes. Now what happens when everybody does as they see fit in their own eyes? It means there's no right and there's no wrong. It means there's no system or morals to follow. It means there's no anything. You can do whatever you want and call it okay. And that's what was happening in the days of the judges. Now God had said to his people, when you go into the land that I'm going to give you, if you follow me, if you keep my decrees and follow my laws, I will bless you. I will bless you. But if you turn away from me and go after other gods, then you will bring curses upon yourselves. And unfortunately, in the times of the judges, sometimes it was a good judge like Gideon, or, or, or Deborah, who rose up and brought the people back to God again. But they kept wandering away. They kept walking away from God's laws. And so we read in the days of the judges' rule, there was a famine in the land. 
Now let's think about that for a moment, the famine, because God had promised he would bless them. God had promised them abundant harvests when they went into the land, if they kept his ways. So what, what is this famine all about? Well, you see, it could have been as a result of a natural disaster. It could have been as a result of a drought or a storm or whatever. But it's also very possible that this famine was caused by the fact that the Israelites had allowed their enemies to run rampant over them and that they had come in and they had burned. You remember in Judges or in Gideon's story how we read they burned the crops and they stole the livestock? And if you burn all the crops and pillage all the fields, you've got no seed left to sow. And so there's a mixture of what could be going on here. But what we certainly see is when people turn away from God, we can't then turn around and blame him when disasters happen because he said they will. Now, note, there are always faithful people in the midst of the story who suffer when other people make bad choices. We'll come back to that. But ultimately, every disaster, every lack that we have in this world is a result of sin and turning away from God. Not necessarily yours, but generally sin at large in the world. So there's a famine. And then we read, and a man. And I love that, that the cosmic God, the creator God of all the universe also knows about this man, this individual, this person, because God is the God of the cosmic. He is the God of the universe, but he knows you and he knows your name and he knows your needs and he cares about you. There's a famine in the land and a man from Bethlehem. Does anybody know what Bethlehem means? The house of bread, a famine in the house of bread. Bethlehem, the bread basket of Israel, and there's a famine in the very place that is called the house of bread. And you can almost imagine this man, can't you? Looking around him from Bethlehem and seeing that there's no food to feed his family, for his wife, for his sons. And perhaps he looks out over the horizon and he sees Moab in the distance. And thinks to himself, why would I stay here? Why would I live in this place where there's no food when I can go to Moab and there have provision for my wife and, and for my sons? And so he decides, it says, <coughs> together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Do you know what's missing here? He sought God. He asked God what he should do. God told him to go to Moab. It's not there. You see, this man sees a problem. And instead of asking God, what am I to do? How do you want to solve this problem, God? He, he decides by himself, I know, I'll go to Moab. I'll provide a solution for my family. I'll do something to meet the need. But he doesn't stop to ask God, you see. And we know that God has told the people that they're to live in the land of Israel. They're to live in the land, not Moab. They're to live in Judah. They're to live in the country that God has given them, the promised land. But we can really understand why he would do that, can't we? Why he would go. I mean, it's nothing that his ancestors didn't do before him. Do you remember Abraham? Let's go down to Egypt. That didn't work out too well, did it? as he nearly lost his wife. Do you remember how he decided he couldn't wait for God anymore to have a son and decided I'll have a son my own way with Hagar and the disaster that that has brought upon the world ever since? You see, we're tempted, aren't we, to look for solutions to our problems in our own way, to look where far off fields are green often and think it'll be better over there without stopping to ask God what he thinks and what his plan for us is. It's ironic that this man was called Elimelech. Do you know what that means? My God is king. My God is king. Or God is my king. Could you say that? My God is king or God is my king. Could you, could you say it 
and really mean it. See, Elimelech was called that. That's obviously what his parents wanted for him, that he would grow up to be a man whose king was God. But Elimelech is not living up to his name. When he steps out of that place of trust and waiting for God to provide and goes to seek his own fortune, his own way. Elimelech, my God is king. His wife's name was Naomi, which means pleasant. Now remember that names had a lot of meaning as they gave children names back in these days, they had meaning. And then we get to the two sons and I don't know what circumstances were going on around the birth of these two boys, but the first one is called Malin, which means sickly. Imagine calling your child sickly. Maybe he was sick as a baby. And the second one is called Killian, which has something to do with weeping and crying. So maybe he was just a wee yap. Who knows? <laughs> That's what my granny used to call me, by the way. <laughs> but they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. That's a, a region in, in Bethlehem. Do you remember how the prophet Micah says, out of you, Bethlehem Ephratha will come, uh, etc. So that's where that comes from. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, do you know anything about Moab or the Moabites? Because they started in a rather dubious way as a people. I don't know if you, if you can cast your mind back to the story of Lot. Uh, and Lot, as he left Sodom and Gomorrah, remember the city that was put on fire and he left with his two daughters. Well, they went out and they lived because they were afraid for their lives. So they went out and lived in caves. Now, this is, not, this is a bit of a seedy story, so... Small ears, none, none listening, that's good. Uh, the two daughters decided that there were no men for them to have children with, so what were they gonna do to maintain the family line? And so they decided to get their father drunk, and when he was drunk, they would lie with him, uh, uh, and they did, and the oldest one conceived a child, and she called him Moab. And so this whole race of people, the Moabites, came from this incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter, and they worshiped a god called Chemosh. So when Elimelech went to this land, he knew that although they were distant cousins, these people did not worship the true God. So they go there. And do you notice how it said that he intended to go there for a while? For a while. I reckon his plan was always to come back to Bethlehem. He thought, I'll go there for a while. I live off the fullness of Moab for a while. And I'll come back to God when things are better or when I'm ready. I'll go and enjoy that for a while and I'll come back to God at some point. Do you know the really sad thing in the story is we're about to read that Elimelech died and he never got to come back to Bethlehem. I don't know what his relationship with God was like when he lived in Moab. Did he have thoughts for God? I don't know. But he thought that what he was only going to do for a while could be put right later. But later never came. It's a warning, isn't it? Sometimes we think, I'll turn to God. I'll come back to God after whatever that is. Be careful. Because that opportunity may never come. Verse 3, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. We don't know why, what cause. But she was left with her two sons. Elimelech made a choice. I want us to think a wee bit this morning about making choices. He made a choice. He made a choice to move out of the land of promise. And sometimes when we make choices, now he made the choice with good intentions, but it was a bad choice. And sometimes when we make choices, consequences follow. And we can't turn around and blame God for our bad choices. God has given us free will and people make bad choices. So the two sons are about to make another bad choice. I thought God's going to redeem it, as we will see, because God redeems even our worst mistakes. They marry Moabite women. Not a good thing to do. Think back to the story of Balaam, where it was the Moabite women, Moabite women who took the men of Israel away from God to worship their God. So not a good choice again. Uh, and it says they lived there for about 10 years. We don't know whether that was after they married or 10 years and all. But then Malin and Killian also died. I mean, it's tragedy upon tragedy, isn't it? And your heart can't help feeling for poor Naomi because none of this was her choice. But she ends up in the situation where she's lost her husband, lost her two boys, 
and she's now a widow. Now, I know some of you know what that's like and, and it's hard in today's society. But think back to what it would have been like then. Women couldn't work. Women belonged to men. So if they had no men in their life, they were nobody and had nothing. They couldn't own property. And so as a widow without a son or a husband, Naomi was probably going to starve to death. Or worse, as she sought to find a way to provide for herself. So she's in a really difficult position, and not only that, she's now got these two daughters-in-law who she feels responsible for as well, Orpah and Ruth. It's a desperate situation. And it's not until now in verse 6 that we even get God mentioned in this book. But in verse 6 it says, When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, the Lord... The word used there is Yahweh, the covenant name for God, the covenant God who'd promised he would always provide for his people. See, there were people who'd waited in Bethlehem who trusted that God would provide. And Naomi is reminded that the Lord, the covenant God of Israel, has now come to the aid of his people and has provided food for them. And so now Naomi has this dilemma. Stay or go? Will I stay or will I go? I wonder, did she sit down and write a wee list? Pros and cons, staying and leaving. Stay, my husband and sons are buried here. Stay, I've been here 10 years. Stay, fear, what would even be left in Bethlehem for me if I go back there? Go back, maybe there is still some family there who will have mercy on me. Maybe if I go back, God will be merciful. And I wonder, did she ever in her heart think, in all those years she was in Moab, about the tabernacle and about the presence of God and about the worship that she would have grown up with. And I wonder, did she think to herself, I need to go back to God. We read in verse 22, we'll come back to the middle section, but she returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. You see, she draws a line in the sand and she says, it's time. It's time for me to leave this country of Moab, this country that looked so promising where the fields were green. It's time to leave this place of tragedy. It's time to leave this place of sorrow and grief and mourning and bitterness. And it's time for me to turn around and go back to God and go back to the house of bread. Go back to the house of God. It's a beautiful picture of repentance really, isn't it? Turning around from that place of compromise and journeying back to God. Do you know, it's a, it's a long journey away from God, step by step by step. But when we turn around, it's only one step back to God because he comes to meet us. What is God saying to us through this as we draw to a close this morning? Well, we can't help but draw that parallel, can we, between the, t the time of the judges where everybody did as they saw fit in their own eyes and our days, can we? We can see those parallels very clearly. There are no morals, there is no moral code, no moral rule, you can do whatever you want. Nothing's wrong, choose what you will. And then we wonder why things go wrong. We have no time for God, we compromise, we flirt with other gods. We say everybody has the right to believe in whatever God they want to believe in. We'll embrace multi-faiths. We'll compromise with multi-faiths. We'll adopt some of their practices. We'll adopt some of the practices of the world into, into the worship of God. And then we wonder why things go wrong. We wonder why there are stabbings on our streets. We wonder why the streets 
of Gaza are as they are? Friends, people make choices. And when we make bad choices, consequences follow. Now let me re-emphasize again that sometimes good, godly, faithful, God-honoring people suffer because of the sin of other people and other people's bad choices. Yes. So do not hear condemnation if you have known tragedy or difficulty. I'm not saying it's because of your sin. I'm saying it's because of sin in the world. It's because of people's choices. It's because we have banished God from our societies and from our thinking. We're not allowed to mention God in schools and then we wonder why ch children are killing people on the streets. Why is God letting this happen? What, would that be the God that you don't believe in that's letting this happen? The God that you don't honor and the God that you don't serve? We've got to be real and acknowledge that the things that are happening in this world are largely because people have turned away from God and sin is getting worse and worse and abounds among us. But the people of God have the assurance that even when those bad things and those tragedies and those things happen in our families and our lives that God has promised he's still faithful. He's still sovereign. And even in the midst of the bad thing, he's working something good. While we may not see it looking forward, we will see it looking backwards. So we can trust him in the midst of it all. The other thing is that we can pray for God's protection in the midst of it all. We can pray that he would spare us and save us from some of the bad choices that other people are making in the world. But church, we need to be really careful that we are being his church, that we are being his people, and that we are not compromising in any way with the sin around us. Second thing is, Elimelech goes off to far off fields that look green. He goes off after what are the devices and desires of his own heart, what, what he thinks will be good apart from God. Jesus spoke about that. And he said those who seek to save their own lives will lose them. But those who lose their lives for me will know eternal life. It's also sad in this story that Naomi doesn't turn her thoughts back to God until the situation is desperate. But isn't that true of us all sometimes? We journey along happily until things go really wrong and then we turn to God and miss the joy of living with him day by day. But I also love in this story we will see as we continue that when she turns back to God, he welcomes her. And he'll welcome you and me every time we turn back to him because he's good and he's gracious and he longs for you to live as his child, loved and provided for. And lastly, as I was reading this, I was thinking about a new season in the church and I really felt like God is saying to us, church, it's time. It's time to come back to the house of bread. It's time to come back to the house of God. The house of bread, Jesus said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's time that we were a church who are feeding richly on the word of God. It's time to come back. Friends, if you're listening at home on YouTube, if you can, it's time for you to come back. It's time for you to come back to God's house. You see, you can be a Christian on your own in your own small corner. Yes, of course you can, but that's not what Jesus told us to do. 
He said that we should come together, that we should nurture and feed off his word together, that we should strengthen one another. And so as we approach back to Church Sunday, I'm putting out a call, come back to the house of bread, come back to the house of God, if you can. And maybe you sitting here know somebody who's abandoned the house of God and the house of bread. Please invite them to come back. And is it just possible that maybe you're sitting here in church this morning and although your body is on a pew, your heart is far from the house of God and from the house of bread. God's calling you this morning. Come back. There's a welcome. There's grace. There's forgiveness. There's nurture. There's strength. There's a new way. God will provide the bread. And lastly, Jesus himself said, didn't he, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. Jesus is calling us this morning back to him, the bread of life. <laughs> you're welcome if you know and love the Lord Jesus. And you're coming to him this morning saying, Jesus, I recognize you are the bread of life. I recognize that your body was broken for me. And come, even as you kneel at the communion rail, make your covenant with him. I'm coming back, Lord. I'm coming back in my heart, in my mind, with my whole heart, with my whole mind, with all that I am as this new season begins. Lord, I'm giving myself completely to you. I'm coming back to the bread of life, to the house of bread. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gave your life that we might know your life, that we might live in the fullness of your life, the abundant life, richly fed on the bread of heaven, the word of God, Jesus filling us in every way. Thank you, God, that you're always gracious and you always welcome us back into your loving care. So come, Holy Spirit, and help us to respond as we worship, as we join in communion. We thank you, Lord, that whatever mistakes we make, whatever bad choices we make or the world around us makes, we thank you, Lord, that you're sovereign in it all sovereign over it all and you will work all things for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose let's stand and worship together there is strength within the sorrow
<laughs> well, welcome back, children. They're here, but more importantly, the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Father, Lord of all creation, we praise you for your goodness and your love. When we turned away from you, you did not reject us. But you came to meet us in your son, welcomed us as your children, and prepared a table where we might feast with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. <clears throat> he opened wide his arms upon the cross, and with love stronger than death, he made... Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, on the night before you died, you came to table with your friends. Taking bread, you gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we bless you. You are the bread of life. At the end of supper, you took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we bless you. You are the true vine. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Holy Spirit, giver of life. Come upon us now. Bring us back to the house of bread. Bring us afresh to the bread of life, to Jesus. And may this bread and wine be to us as the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, Make us who know our need of grace, one in Christ, our risen Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you the sacrifice of thanks and praise and lift our voice to join the song of heaven forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Thanks be to you, our God, for your gift beyond words. Amen, amen, and amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We, being many, are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Please be seated. If those who are helping with communion could come forward now, please.
So draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, his blood, which he shed for you. Remember, he died for you. So feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving.
Eternal God, we have received these tokens of your promise. May we who have been nourished with holy things live as faithful heirs of your promise kingdom. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, Father, as we finish this morning, we, we lift up to you those who we know and love, who especially need you in these days. We all need you, Lord, but... For those who are walking through difficulties, for those who are facing health challenges, for those who've had disappointments and bereavements and tragedies, and for those who are struggling just to know you and find you in these days. Lord, we pray for your mercy and your grace, that you would reach down and touch them and lift up their eyes to see you again. And in you, may they find courage and strength and healing. Lord, we pray for ourselves as we go out into the world this week. Help us to be your faithful witnesses. Lord, help us to go on being filled with you day by day so that we shine your light in the darkness around. We sum up our prayers and praying in the words that Jesus taught us, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen and so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you and all those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Sorry, we've overshot a little bit time-wise this morning. It'll be a shorter service next week, so do come back. Uh, just to be reminded that Sunday school is on next week. Okay, so although it's back to church Sunday, Sunday school already starts quarter past 10. So please do encourage your own children and all other children that belong to the parish or go nowhere else to come along to Sunday school. Remember, don't make Sunday dinner next week, or if you do, plan it for the evening because we're having hot dogs, burgers, and ice cream after church. Hopefully see you this evening. One last, 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 last wee thing. If you could help out with Children's Church, you've seen that we have a growing band of children. Praise God for that. But we need to care for them and provide for them. So if you could help out with Children's Church, please speak to me. If we get enough people, it would only be once every now and again. Let's worship our ever faithful God. Let's stand together.
my father. 